Welcome to the Brown Bag. Um, today we have a wonderful presenter. He's amazing. He's like going to talk to us about the Iron Man and the history of Iron Man, which is perfect because we actually have a display on Iron Man in the museum right now. This display was supposed to be part of the Iron Man competition. Dennis spent a lot of work and a lot of effort writing up the panels on the uh, present on Iron Man. And, uh, and then they canceled it. And I'm like, didn't they know that he was going to have this presentation there? I know. So then I said, Dennis, would you like to do a brown bag on the <laughs> Iron Man? Since you've done all this research. And he said, of course. So here we are. So of course, Dennis is our curator manager. And um, I'm going to stop talking. The only thing I'm going to ask you to do is if you have a cell phone, could you switch it to no ring? And then. Um, I think that's it. It's all yours. Take it away. Thank you, Chandra. <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, thanks, as always, for coming today. I see we have uh, an intimate crowd. I won't use the word smaller. I like intimate better. And uh, thanks for coming out. Thanks for your interest in uh, today's brown bag. Um, I'm going to sort of do an overview of the history of uh, of the Iron Man. It's got a fair number of ins and outs, um, but one thing is for sure, uh, Penticton played an outside ro uh, outsized role in, uh, in Iron Man, and Iron Man uh, especially in uh, North America. So, um, like, like the panel says, I'm sure you've all read it already, um, the beginnings of Iron Man uh, came up with this, this couple, uh, John and Judy Collins. He was a career naval officer, and he was stationed in various places, uh, usually on the American West Coast, on the West Coast of the U.S. and in Hawaii, obviously. He must have been uh, well-liked by his superiors because he got all these fantastic postings. But uh, while he was in San Diego, um, he and his wife, they, they were athletes, uh, amateur athletes, he and his wife participated in uh, a Mission Bay Triathlon in San Diego. That's one of the first triathlon events in North America. So later on, um, he was posted to Hawaii, and uh, that's where the Iron Man story starts. That's uh, uh, Commander Collins and uh, his wife and their two kids, who also participated in, in, uh, in the Iron Man uh, events that they started. So Iron Man came about um, basically through a discussion, through a conversation that Collins, the, the Collinses were having with, with friends of theirs. Um, they hung out with a lot of athletes. Um, there were a lot of uh, very dedicated athletes and even you could call them elite athletes amongst the, uh, the uh, na U.S. naval community in Hawaii. Uh, there were a lot of swimmers, a lot of runners, a lot of... Uh, a bicyclist and, and these these Collins Collins knew 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 them all mostly. He knew a lot of them, and uh, there's there was this uh, they were having a discussion one day about who who could be the best athlete, who is who is the uh, the top athlete, and he referenced a magazine article that spoke about uh, a Belgian Tour de France participant named Eddie Merckx. Now Eddie Merckx won the Tour de France. I forget how many times. Um, I think four or five times, and I think that record still holds, especially since Lance Armstrong, if you recall, was disqualified for drug use. But at any rate, Eddie Merckx was in the Tour de France in the uh, 60s and I believe early 70s. And this magazine article said that he had the highest intake of oxygen and he was probably one of the, f the, the fittest athlete in the world, at least to their knowledge. So out of that idea came, uh, out of that uh, article came the idea, well, let's, let's have an event where, where athletes will participate in swimming, um, a marathon, and a cycling event. And um, it might not settle the, the debate of who's fittest, but nonetheless, it'll be, it'll be quite a thing. And whoever finishes will call it the Ironman competition. And um, as it says there, um, the name Iron Man came up because of a, a runner who worked at the Honolulu Naval Shipyards, and he just was, he was 
famous for, for just running and running and running and never tiring. And so that's where they came up with the idea. And you can see here, they came up to, to a, almost a two and a half mile swim, 112 mile cycling course, and a full marathon of just over 26 miles. And um, this is, this is what, uh, this, these were the parameters of the contest. I forget exactly, I think it says in the next panel, but they didn't get that many people to sign up for the first Ironman contest. And you have to understand that this was, uh, this was uh, something done on the back of an envelope almost. Uh, it was organized, uh, but it was all volunteer. And uh, it, it, was just, it, just, it was not uh, excessively uh, promoted or anything like that. It was, it was more or less a gathering of friends. So there you have the Iron Man contestants gathering at the very beginning. A lot of short haircuts, a lot of uh, naval personnel. So here we go, the first Iron Man, uh, February 18th, 1978, just 15 competitors. And of those 15, 12 completed the race. Uh, Gordon Haller, uh, a naval, naval uh, he wasn't an officer, but he, was, he worked in communications. He finished first, followed by a Navy SEAL. Uh, not surprising, I imagine Navy SEALs are pretty fit. And he came in second. And uh, there were a lot of stories that came out of it, but uh, the, the guy who came in second rehydrated himself with beer towards the end of the, uh, towards the, end of the race. And he was a bit wobbly, but he did, he did make it. Now, there's not a lot of photos available from the first uh, Ironman competition. It was just friends of people participating, taking snapshots here and there. But this is this is this is this photo is from the first Ironman competition. I don't know who these guys are. I think they're probably Navy people. And uh, here they are, uh, presumably getting ready for the race. So they did it. They put it together. Um, like I said, there are only 15 competitors, and Collins Collins participated as well. Thanks, Chandler. So Collins participated as well. It took him 17 hours to complete the course, and that became the official cutoff time. Like after 17 hours, uh, the race closed down. So they wanted to do it again, and they did it the following year. This time they had 50 athletes. Um, there was bad weather. Only 15 athletes remained to do the race. A fellow named Tom Warren of San Diego came first. I couldn't find out whether he was uh, a Navy SEAL or anything like that. I think he was, I think he was uh, just, just an athlete and not associated with the Navy. And then um, the first Iron Woman participated, Lynn LaMare. She is from Boston. She placed six, very respectable showing. And she became the first Iron Woman. And uh, as you would expect with, the, with, this, sort of, uh, with this sort of event, uh, you know, a lot of quirky characters came, came along and uh, they, they did their own thing. Uh, you saw some amusing costumes and there was the cow man, for instance, who you'll see more of later on. Um, uh, the zebra man, I think. Um, a fellow who wore a football helmet the whole time. Uh, even, during the swim, even during the swim portion, what he was thinking of, I, I have no idea. And, but there was quite a lot of this. It was, it was, it was. I think the co competitors were determined to have their own fun with the event as well, and not to take it too seriously. Now, um, a big turnaround came when um, Sports Illustrated um, wrote an article about about the Ironman race, about the second Ironman race. And one of their best writers, Barry McDermott, wrote it. Uh, he was there to cover a golf tournament. And so he wrote quite a long article about it. And it's Sports Illustrated, and uh, it had a circulation of several millions, probably. And so um, that was the beginning of uh, Iron Man gaining a much larger audience, and awareness of it was just launched, launched into outer space. It just became a household name pretty much amongst the sport, sports community. And you can see here, this is the, uh, it's the inside of the magazine, uh, the intro to the article. 
and uh, I was able actually to track a copy of it down and purchase it through eBay. So we have the actual magazine on display at the museum. It took a while to find, but there we go. Um, this alarming picture uh, shows Julie Moss. Um, she, she was uh, an Iron, Iron Man competitor. And uh, just towards the very end of the race, you can see the, uh, see the finish line right there. She collapsed through a combination of dehydration and fatigue. And, uh, but nonetheless, she pulled herself across on her hands and, on her hands and knees, as you can see. And uh, this, this, this uh, image uh, sort of came to epitomize the Iron Man spirit in the sense that certainly it was a race and it was good to come in first and second and third, but just finishing it was, was a triumph. It was seen as, as, as something that you could look back on your entire life and, and be proud of your, uh, your achievement in just finishing the race. And, uh, you know, with over 100 miles bicycling, two miles swimming, and a full marathon, I think, yeah, it's, a, it's really something to, uh, to, 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 remember, to remember as a personal uh, achievement. But at any rate, um, at this point, I don't know the exact story, but uh, John Collins uh, was still a naval officer. Maybe he was posted to another location, but uh, they, they were no longer involved. They had dropped their interest in Ironman. And um, there were t uh, local Nautilus Fitness Club owners in Hawaii, uh, Valerie Silk and Hank Grunman. They, um, they, I believe they purchased the rights Although it's it's the information is a little bit hard to discern, but um, they purchased the rights to use the Iron Man name. So I assume at some point uh, John and Judy Collins had uh, registered the Iron Man uh, brand. So they moved it to uh, the island of Oahu. They changed the date of the race from February to October. This is the, the new owners, uh, Valerie Silk and Hank Grunman. And uh, yeah, the 82 Iron Man, uh, this is where uh, Julie Moss, uh, where this famous picture was taken as she struggles uh, over the finish line. I, I myself have, you know, I, I wonder, I mean, if, you, if you're that exhausted and that tired that you can't stand up, I, I just hope that there's competent medical help available <laughs> the minute you cross because dehydration and exhaustion are, are uh, you know, pretty serious conditions, but nonetheless, she finished it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit. Um, so at this point, uh, in the early 80s, uh, the fame of the Iron Man event was, was, was sort of spreading around the world, and, and people were coming from all over the world to participate. And um, one story, probably the definitive story, because it keeps coming up, um, is that uh, it was uh, the mayor of, of Kelowna who first heard about Iron Man, and uh, he wanted to uh, he wanted he wanted to bring it to Kelowna, and um, but in the end he 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 decided against it. They wanted a smaller event, and uh, they did that the Apple Classic Triathlon in 1982. I don't know too much about the Apple Classic. I don't know see how it could be a smaller event in the sense that uh, it would have had to have been a, a triathlon, just like the Ironman, and presumably just as long in all the various categories. But I guess it didn't have the Ironman name behind it and uh, would be a, a smaller and more controllable event. So there was um, a fellow named Ron Zelko, and he was a Vancouver businessman. He had a, he had a fitness uh, club. And he was also an athlete, and he had participated in the Ironman in Hawaii. And uh, he wanted to bring it to Canada. And uh, it was problematic for a lot of people to get all the way to Hawaii to compete. And he thought, well, this is, this is an event that's tailor-made for, uh, for British Columbia, and, uh, and that the Okanagan would be a good place to bring it. So he uh, he's tried to drum up some interest, and he spoke to uh, the Chamber of Commerce of both Kelowna and uh, Penticton. And uh, there was interest at both places, although Kelowna eventually turned him down. But he, he handed out some brochures and he made some 
filled out the forms and various permissions to, to, to begin a race. So he sort of laid the groundwork uh, in the administrative sense, and uh, he had some brochures made as well. Um, I, I guess I should talk about these pictures. I think this is from the very first uh, Iron Man in uh, Penticton, and this is one of the competitors leaving the water. He's going to go grab his bicycle and start the bicycle portion of the race. Uh, who this fellow is, I don't know. And um, this is a, a volunteer refreshment station along the uh, bicycle portion of the race. From the very beginning, there was great uh, interest in volunteering in Penticton, and that became a defining, uh, a defining characteristic of Penticton's uh, uh, involvement in the Ironman. Everybody commented on it. There was never any shortage of volunteers. Their enthusiasm and their and their dedication to Ironman were, were really stood out. So, at this point, we have a woman named Lynn Ben Dove, and she lived here in Penticton, and she picked up a brochure that Ron Zelko had left behind at the, uh, at the tourism center, I believe. And uh, she, had some, she had some experience in organizing uh, apparently in organizing a triathlon, although I'm not too sure, actually. She had experience in organizing all sorts of different events, and some of them were athletic events, but I don't know if she, she had organized a triathlon. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But at any rate, she was very interested. Uh, she saw that the image of, um, or actually the video of Julie Moss crawling over the finish line, and it really, really impressed her. And she thought this is something she wanted to be involved in, and she would like to, uh, uh, give some of her energy and organizational talent to uh, to getting Iron Man to um, to Penticton. So uh, she picked up a brochure that Ron Zalco had left behind, and she found herself talking to Ralph Siegel, who was Zalco's business partner. And right at, during that same phone call, Siegel said, "Why don't you be the rate, the assistant race director, and uh, we'll go from there." So it just sort of snowballed from there. This image here is the beginning ceremonies of the Ironman race. Uh, I wasn't able to get a date. It's probably, just, you know, mid to late 80s, I would say. So Penticton was the very first community to host an Ironman. Well, there's a caveat to that, but we'll get to that. To, to, to host an Ironman in North America. And, uh, this, this really put Penticton on the map uh, amongst the triathlon community because this is the name they associated with running a triathlon in North America, Penticton. So Van Dub picked up the reins and uh, she became the central person in organizing the Ironman. But it wasn't, uh, like it says, it wasn't smooth sailing. Uh, they found that uh, Zalco and Siegel had assumed or just hope that they could use the Iron Man name. They couldn't, it was copyrighted, it was, it was nailed down as a trademark, and uh, they got a phone call from, uh, from Valerie Silk in Hawaii saying, back off, uh, or we'll get our lawyers on to you. So the first Iron Man in North America became known as the Iron Person. So, and I guess that's apropos because both men and women participated. So, a, in the first one is August 20th, 1983, 26 athletes, and uh, at first there were no female, uh, female competitors, but um, they found an athlete who was willing to run the race, a female athlete in Banff, and they paid her way uh, to, to participate. So, uh, not, not a huge number of contestants, but everything seemed to click, everything seemed to work, there were no there were a few glitches, uh, but there was no major problems. So it's sort of setting the template for success later on. Now, because they couldn't use the Iron Man name, and I don't think they wanted to use Iron Person anymore, uh, exactly why I don't know, but what they did is they called it the Canadian International Ultra Triathlon. And that, that's what it was called from in 1984 and 1985. And uh, uh, these were successful races. They, they were uh, organizers, Van Dove and, and other, other people were, 
we're uh, ironing out all the all the all the bugs. Everything that could could go wrong maybe went wrong. They fixed it and they they just they move forward and uh, begin to began to host some very successful races. And of course, <clears throat> in Penticton, it became this is this is the third, uh, second, third, and so on. Our Ironman or triathlon event in Penticton, and people were getting used to it, and people were looking forward to it. And volunteers wanted to volunteer the next time around, and new volunteers were found, and business people were seeing opportunities with the number of visitors. So it started to percolate through to Penticton as a community. But um, this was more than just a uh, a sporting event. It was it was something that was coming to Penticton was defining the race, and the race was defining Penticton in a, in a way. So um, now there was a turning point, sort of came around in the history of Iron Man. Uh, there was a short film, and it was uh, produced and edited by Wayne McDougall, who is the brother of our very own Barry McDougall, who works in our archives, and. Uh, he put, he put the short film together, um, and Valerie Silk, I think you remember her, she, she owns the rights to, she owned the rights to Iron Man. She saw the film. I think Lynn Van Dove sent it to her, and she was impressed. She was impressed with what she saw. She was impressed with the number of volunteers and, and, and their enthusiasm. She was impressed with the people of the town and how they cheered on the contestants, and she was impressed with the natural beauty of the area which you can certainly see here. This is the cowman, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's him. I, I, he, uh, I read up a bit about him. He just, I, I don't know uh, what he did for a living, but he just seems to be an extreme sports junkie. And uh, he would show up at triathlon events all over the world and, and just do his thing. Uh, but I know for a fact he didn't wear his, uh, his buffalo horn helmet or hat while he was swimming. I know that for a fact. <laughs> So yeah, and he was he was just he was sort of a celebrity associated with with Iron Man, and I should just explain this uh, again. I'd say this is mid 80s to late 80s. Um, this is the transition area between the contestants. The first the first event is the swim event, and so that happens quite early in the morning, and then the contestants go to this area right here on the on the on the, on the park on the park frontage and along the beach. They pick up their bicycles and off they go. So, at any rate, Van Dove credited this short film by Wayne McDougall with, um, with uh, changing Valerie Silk's mind uh, and uh, awarding uh, Penticton the, the Iron Man license. Now, so, and that happened in 86, and so this is the, finally the first official uh, Iron Man. Uh, prior to that, it had other names, Iron Person and the Canadian Ultra Marathon, etc. And, um, and by this time, they had a pretty good track record of putting a, a triathlon event on. And so, but now it was an official Ironman event. And this, is, this, this, this was a big turning point because amongst uh, elite athletes and triathlon participants, uh, the Ironman name had a real cachet. It was really, it was, it was a real draw. It's something you wanted to do. And uh, so this, this meant that uh, that Iron Man really took off in Penticton. And of course, for the very first 1986 Iron Man, uh, Hawaiian based Iron Man personnel came to assist. Uh, at this point, Iron Man was, uh, it was more or less a business. Uh, you had people uh, associated with specific uh, uh, portions of the race. You had a swim director, you had a cycle course director, you had you had the, uh, the the marathon director, and uh, these people would look after every every detail of their particular area of responsibility. It was getting that big; it could no longer really be something that was just addressed by uh, and and run by volunteers. And so, uh, like I mentioned here at the very first Ironman, they had uh, John and Judy Collins were there. Uh, well. The cow man, his name was John Shirk, and let's see who else. Oh yeah, the zebra man. He had this sort of one one piece of fit that was that was striped like a zebra. I couldn't find a decent photograph of him. Uh, Patrick Garlop, the first um, 
first people's Iron Man, uh, Lee, Lee Crowchild. Sorry, the Zebra Man was Patrick Garlip. The first people's Iron Man is Lee Crowchild. And the very first Iron Man, winner Gordon Haller, from way back from 1978 in Hawaii. And this is Lynn Van Dub, and she's uh, speaking to some indigenous dancers who were part of the opening ceremonies. Well, maybe not the opening ceremonies, but they're part of the ceremonies. So, 86, the very first official Iron Man. Now, what I like, I wanted to include this photo, because what I like about this is it shows the, uh, this is the original 1978 Hawaiian Iron Man triathlon. Uh, this, this, this chunk of wood that it's sitting on is some exotic uh, wood that you can only find in, on the Hawaiian Islands. I, I forget the name, sorry. And you can see that, that this, is, this is a very modest sort of thing. And it says, hey, you did it, and this is what you get. And, and there, was, there, was no, there was no cash prizes. There was no uh, beautiful, beautifully made uh, trophies or what have you. This is what you got. And uh, there were some very modest T-shirts made as well, but I, I, I like this because it speaks to the uh, the amateur nature of the beginning of Iron Man. And it was it was maybe in some ways it was it was more fun when it was small. I don't know. So um, now, in speaking about Iron Man to uh, to all the various people who are involved in Penticton. Um, you come to realize that uh, Lynn Van Dove um, had quite a role in, in defining Iron Man and bringing forward a bunch of traditions. Um, she had, I think, a good eye for, uh, for creating a bit of a spectacle. Uh, she had uh, various songs played, um, uh, you know, by the band Van Halen, Aaron Copeland, Fanfare for the Common Man, and the Traveling Wilburys, Heading for the Light. This is all real 80s stuff. And um, these, these were the uh, musical themes that she sort of built the various events around. I'm sure other music was played, but those three are stand out. Um, there was uh, all the, all, one thing that she, uh, uh, that she started was having all the competitors make their way to the lake uh, with bagpipers leading the way. There were color-coded t-shirts for all the race personnel and many of the volunteers. And um, yeah, it, it, Iron Man took on a personality and, and she had a lot to do with that. And of course, there's the natural beauty of our lovely Okanagan Valley. And um, it's sort of, as, as Judy Collins said way back in Hawaii, it's, the venue is important because people try harder in beautiful places. Now, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Um, and and this, is where, this is where things got a bit complicated for me as a researcher, because I'm talking to people who are involved in Iron Man. Almost everybody's still around. Everybody has their own opinion. Uh, sometimes they're very strong opinions. And I'd be on the phone and I'd be holding the phone three or four inches away from my ear and, and taking notes madly. And I, this is all very interesting, but I can't use it. Um, you know, <laughs> and so, um, so I'll just, I'll just, I'll just say, you know, at this, at this point that, uh, um, Iron Man had accumulated a sizable debt. Um, the city recognized the value of hosting Iron Man. Uh, it did bring quite a lot of money into the city. It put Penticton on the map. Uh, there were benefits to hosting Iron Man. And, um, but, but nonetheless, I think despite everybody's best efforts, there was always a deficit and there was always a debt. And it built up, I believe, from year to year. And the city didn't want to pay it. And I'm sure the city taxpayers didn't want to, didn't want to pay it. So, and I think what this did was it pushed Iron Man towards a more professional approach in that they started to look for sponsors. The first big sponsor was Timex. So Timex came on board. You would see the Timex logo everywhere. They obviously did all the, the clocks and the timing for the various events. And Timex even came out with an Iron Man watch 
and it was a huge success for them. I don't know how many, how many they sold, but I think it was in the millions. So they needed, they needed proper sponsors. They needed a proper organization. Um, that would be the Ironman Canada Association, which, um, which was formed of Penticonites. Um, I think the chairperson was Judy Sentis. Most of you would recognize her name. She was a counselor for many years. So Judy Sentis was involved with that and a number of uh, uh, different Penticton residents. They were all involved in, in the committee. Um, they, they would often knock heads with Lynn Van Dove over different ideas as to how to carry this thing forward. And, um, but nonetheless, I think the overall thrust of it was, is this is getting too big. Um, it needs people who really, really know what they're doing and can, can, can concentrate on, on organizing the race, even pretty much year round. And uh, if we do get sponsors on board, Subaru is a big sponsor. Um, they have certain expectations in, in return. Uh, in return for them uh, being, in return for their sponsorship, they have certain expectations around the event itself. And those, those expectations will be written down in, in legal documents and it has to be, it has to be honored. So you can see how, how far the whole event had come from, certainly from 1978 in, uh, in Hawaii, where you've got the second place finisher chugging beer and running across the, uh, running across the finish line. It, it had become a much more professional event. I think I've showed you that photo before, but at any rate, it's it's a typical volunteer station um, along the uh, along the bicyclist route. Um, this is a, a later photo, as is this one. So we had Subaru come in as as a uh, as a sponsor, and that small Subaru dealership you see when you're coming into town that dates from this time. Not only did they sponsor the race, they also set up a dealership. So, um, yeah, and, and so you, you had these problems uh, with debt. Things had to be worked out. I think the city agreed to, to, uh, to an in-kind uh, arrangement where they would provide things like traffic control, um, uh, police and security presence, clothes off the streets, um, you know, things, things sort of directly related to the infrastructure of the city and how it's being used by Iron Man. So they said, we'll take that on. I was never, never able to find out um, who, paid the, uh, who paid the Iron Man debt. Uh, I think it was eventually purchased by a much larger company. But at any rate, um, uh, like I say here, it needs, Iron Man needed new blood, it needed new money and, and, and new, organizational savvy, and that came in the form of Michael and Howard Bregman, two brothers, two athletes, and uh, if you've seen the Second Cup coffee chain, they were the founders of the Second Cup, and they had pretty deep pockets. So they purchased the Ironman license from Van Dove, Lynn Van Dove, and initially the Ironman license, Valerie Silk had awarded it to the um, to the Iron Man Canada Society, and then uh, and then Lynn, then it was given to Lynn Van Dove. So it sort of went back and forth, and uh, I think because Valerie Silk lost confidence in the society, awarded it to Van Dove, and then and then and then and then, but it could no longer be sustained. Um, and it's the way it was at that point. It needed new blood and new money. They produced the race until 1995. And the story behind it's kind of interesting because the Bregmans are from, I know they're from Ontario, I think they're from Toronto. And uh, when they first heard of Iron Man, they wanted to, uh, Iron Man Canada, they wanted to purchase, purchase the franchise, if you can call it that, and they wanted to host it in, in, uh, in the, uh, what's the place called? I've been there. Um, Muskoka, yes, the Muskoka region north of north of Toronto. It's a beautiful area. It's where all the rich Torontonians have their cottages. It's lakes and rivers and hills and forests, and it's beautiful Canadian shield country. 
and that's where they wanted to host it. Um, when uh, Judy Sentis and the rest of the Iron Man Canada Society heard about this, they, they made an emergency trip to Toronto, uh, complete with uh, photos and, and film footage and everything else, and they made a presentation to the Bregmans, and they say, no, you want to leave it here in, in the Okanagan. You want to keep it in Penticton. And, and they were successful. The Bregmans agreed to, to keep it in Penticton. And so moving along fairly quickly, um, Graham Fraser was the next guy uh, to, to take over the Iron Man brand. Uh, he purchased it from the Bregmans. He also, um, he not only owned uh, Iron Man Penticton, but Iron Man Wisconsin, Iron Man Arizona, and, and Iron Man Lake Placid, which uh, is in New York State. So um, he, was, he, he bought it and uh, he did, well, hold on a second. I've got it wrong, sorry, it was Fraser, it was this fellow who wanted to move it to Muskoka. And uh, Judy Sentis and the rest of the Iron Man Canada Society dissuaded him from that. So he agreed to, to have it in Penticton. So at least for one, year, one more year on a trial basis. Um, but um, he saw no reason to move Iron Man after that. So uh, Iron Man was firmly established in Penticton. Uh, Fraser was an experienced sports entrepreneur and sports businessman. He got more, he got more sponsors. He got his organization in there running things. Um, and talking to some people, you get the impression that uh, that uh, Iron Man lost something with this increasing professionalization. And you know, I guess you don't have to be an expert in hosting events and, and event management to know that certainly when an event becomes uh, uh, more organized and with, with, with professionals running things and deadlines and, and, and legal papers and everything else, it's gonna lose some of that spontaneity. On the other hand, um, it's when the event gets too big, you have to have these things. You have to have sponsors willing to put tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars into it, and you have to have professionals running the show. Because not only is it, important as a sporting event, but there's also safety and legal requirements attached to something like an Ironman event. So Graham Fraser, he was, um, he entered a licensing agreement. Um, it gets kind of complicated here because at this point, uh, Valerie Silk had sold, had sold the rights to Ironman to an outfit called the, the World Triathlon Corporation. And anyway, he ran, he ran Ironman and his other Iron Man properties uh, until 2012. Now from 2012 to 2021, there are no Iron Man events scheduled in Penticton. Why that is, I don't know. I think, I think the World Triathlon Corporation might have been asking for a lot from the city and the city didn't feel that they could, that they could uh, acquiesce. They didn't feel that they could do everything that the World Triathlon Corporation wanted, wanted them to do. Um, and, and they certainly didn't want to incur any debt. So I think that that's, that's a possibility. But happily enough, um, in 2022, as you, I'm sure most people here remember, uh, Iron Man came back and uh, came back to Penticton, its first North American venue. Now, of course, we didn't have an Iron Man this year uh, because of the fires and the smoke. But as far as I know, uh, 2024 is, uh, will be an Iron Man year. And this is Graham Fraser on the waterfront. And uh, this is the uh, Circle of Champions, I believe, an Iron Man commemorative uh, area. Now, there's some interesting things that happened in Iron Man along the way, and I'll just touch upon two of them. Um, maybe some of you have heard of Team Hoyt. Uh, this was a, an American family. Uh, they had a son, and he had, uh, what did he have? He had cerebral palsy, and um, the, med the medical prognosis was very grim, but his parents refused to accept it. They said he's not going to exist in this state, as they called it then, of a vegetative state. Uh, 
they taught him the alphabet, they, they, did, they did everything for him to the point where he was eventually able to enroll in school. But one thing he was never able to do was walk and have, uh, you know, full locomotion, full, 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 full abilities. And so um, someone talked his father into, uh, into doing a, a, short, a short five mile run with him and they rigged this up and he pushed him and then they just they just went on from there and this is how they dealt with the uh, swimming portion uh, a bungee cord was attached to uh, to mr hoyt and he would tow his son across uh, on the swimming event two and two and a half miles about and that's how they did that and this is this is how they would do the marathon portion pushing his son ahead of him and this is the cycling portion and uh, by the time uh, Mr. Hoyt retired from the triathlon, I think he died in 2020, um, they had participated in over 1,100 uh, endurance events. So I, I think this is a, a, a fantastic example of, a, of a fatherly love and devotion to his son because he knew that when um, his son was doing these triathlon events, he was fully alive and he very much, uh, very much uh, enjoyed what was happening. And that brings us to another interesting individual, the Iron Nun. Oh, yeah. and, and Sister uh, Mary Dorothy Buter. Um, she, she, she is single-handedly responsible for, uh, uh, for Iron Man having to to do a new age classification because um, I think she was in her 80s when she did the first Iron Man, and they just didn't have uh, an age classification for that for that age, so they had to they had to bring that forward. She trains religiously, as you, one would expect, um, <laughs> and so um, and she she came up with the idea for for endurance events in conversation with 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 a priest that she knew. Who, who said, well, you know, maybe you should give this a try. I, 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 don't, I don't know what the rationale was there, but uh, she took to it like a duck to water. And um, yeah, uh, a, a peerless athlete, and uh, just, just an amazing individual to, to have done this. Um, I think, well, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, she finished the race in 2012 at the age of 82. She, that was her, I think that was her last Ironman. Um, there are prizes associated with the various age categories. Whatever she wins or whatever she has in sponsorship, she turns over to charity. And as a nun, she has no real income. She's, she's taken a vow of uh, poverty and she pretty much needs people put her up and donate equipment and so forth to get her there and back. And that's, that's how she does it. So I, I haven't come across any, um, any information relating to her passing on. I think she, she's well into her 90s now, uh, but she's still with us. But I don't think she's doing uh, endurance uh, events anymore. So um, that concludes the Iron Man story in Penticton. Oh, you're welcome. Lots of research. Yeah. yeah, there's a fair bit of research, and it was, uh, it was, um, I, I, people are giving me uh, banker's boxes full of documents, yeah. and you've got to go through this. And <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I said, it, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of stories associated with um, the Iron Man and Penticton, and, and uh, some of them were conflicting, and, and, uh, but one, th one thing you got, everybody wanted this to be the best event they could possibly do for the city and uh, there were just differing visions of how that was to come about so um, yeah it was it was it's um, and in, in doing this uh, I, I came to Penticton in 2014 so I didn't know too too much about Iron Man so I, I realized how important it was for the city and it was a, a real eye-opener yeah. well thank you very much Dennis oh you're welcome yeah. Um, now it's great to have, a, a, as you say, a very 
outlined in a nice way so it's not very not political and uh, but outlining the importance of the Iron Man to Penticton and um, how it's become a, a, a mainstay to, to our summer events really kind of caps off the end of the summer that and the jazz festival so. all right well thank you very much Dennis I appreciate that you're welcome thank you.